How to do things with video games by Michael Tran. Bogos Ian. Dr. Ian Bogos is award winning, blah blah blah. Uh, you guys can read, but he's a guy who talks about video games and his main profession is to write books about video games and how it relates to the current media. Uh, I'll let you give you guys a few minutes to do this because I recently just did a 15 minute video, so I'm going to try to cut this down as much as possible. This is what the title of the page looks as you see it, how to do things with video games. So if you're ever looking for it in the library, this is what you're looking for. So video games as art. So uh, let me explain, a, a, give you guys a quick brief on how the book is written. The book is written like these these particular subjects, meaning that, okay, one section is about art, one section is about this, one section is about that. So they don't really connect to each other other than like the whole theory that I'm not gonna say it until the very end because I almost caught my I caught myself there. So for starters, that's what it is. And as we go through the slides, each individual chapters have their own points. For starters, there are no unified uh, theories of art. The pursuit of a pure single account of art in any medium is a lost cause. Instead, the history of art has been one of disruptions, reinventions, one of conflicting trends and ideas within each historical period and since the 19th century even more so. So in this particular chapter of art he explains that how can a video games not be considered art. In the past statues were considered art because it was trending you know the Roman times, Renaissance time, buildings, structures and so on but as time changed over time uh, people originally didn't view movies as a, uh, as a piece of art but you know pornographic and all this other stuff that led to movies becoming art because that was the trend at the time and as you see like you know our current modern art is a squeaky dog animal you know statue sitting in the middle of a museum is considered art now so why can't video games be art like I said uh, he mentioned in the book multiple times that it's a trend it's art is a trend so there you can't you cannot see that a video game is not art because that's today's current trend. That gamification is here, that the digital is age here, and that most people nowadays refer to themselves as gamers. And so on. Either hardcore or casual. And that's why we should consider video games as a piece of art. So moving on. Empathy. Empathy is awesome because you, one of the unique properties of video games is the ability to put us in someone else's shoe. So an everyday uh, computer guy, let's say you just day after day do the same thing and stuff that you want to do you can't do because of time constraints so what video games allow us to do is to take our ordinary life and transform it into a fun enthusiastic life when you go into your avatar and you can be anybody you want to be when you have a boss upset you just go into the game and you you, you make the boss in the game uh, you, you, you take your revenge in the game and so on so the idea that he talks about empathy in the chapter is to tell you like how awesome it is to be able to be somebody else even if it's just for that one or two hours. Reverence. So he really didn't mention the magic circle in this chapter but I felt like it was the perfect thing to talk about if you were to talk about reverence. So video games are often accused of disrespect especially for celebrating violent and for encouraging disdain of men woman, culture alike. But can a, be a game do the opposite, embracing respect, deference, and even reverence? So in the article he talks about a situation where a game uh, had a mission that was exactly like a crime that was committed in reality. And, and, they, and the, the, game, the game developers had to take it away because they said, hey, that's not cool that you, you're going to depict this, uh, make one of your missions uh, a crime that's an actual crime in reality. So the sense of the magic circle is there's a separate, uh, uh, there's a separate between the two, one of the real world and one of the virtual reality world, and and there's no there's no entwine like you can't take something from reality and bring it to the game, you can't take something from the game and bring it to reality. So so this the sense of of this this particular uh, quote that I took is like can I take this if I'm disrespectful to somebody in the game, will I be disrespectful to somebody in reality? And if let's say I, re I was respectful in someone in reality, would it be dis uh, disrespectful in the game and vice versa? It's highly opinionated, highly theoried, and I definitely want you, if you want to zone in and into it, uh, reading like oh, my life as a night elf priest and and other other people's reading, but not this one. This one just brought up a theory. 
I recommend you guys go into other books to read to see does it does what you do in game really affect reality and does what you do in reality really affect the game? I believe it does because your personas eventually collide, especially when you have two separate personas in these two different worlds. I, I see them eventually colliding at one point in, in time. So that's my opinion. Uh, read Reverence in the chapter if you want to have better insight of what I'm trying to explain to you. And I'm sorry about trying to hurry up because there's a lot of chapters to cover and I did a lot of reading so I wanted to cover the ones that I'm interested in. So music. We tend to think that music is purely or uh, a purely an aural medium, but one needs not to search hard to find that listening is one way we explain uh, we experience music. What he's stating here in this whole chapter is music plays a huge role in gaming. It it's it's like the narration. It's the narrator. He's he's not the one actually telling the story, like as if there's like story text in the game, but he's actually the one leading the story with the epic music from the beginning that makes like you know that leads into a, a dramatic scene to the excitement of achieving something. Music really plays a huge role, maybe one of the most important roles. But what he explains in the book is that music is like pretty much the way games work. They work around music and not the other way around. So uh, pranks it was kind of you'll read like three pages on this and three pages on that. So how he, how pranks are defined are uh, types of dark humor that traces a razor edge between amusement and injury. So Easter eggs, uh, as you see up in this picture, requires uh, the user to have do a whole bunch of like weird things to find it and the point of the easter eggs was so developers can get close to the players meaning that they understand that the players are spending extra time to find to 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 solve this to find this like easter egg that the developer hide so it means that the play that's how the developers and players relate uh and and you guys may be wondering how is that a prank well that's a prank in that in that definition of easter egg the next thing is farmville farmville or any games that have like monetary money or currency uh defines prank. So prank is somewhat defined as deceitful and the act of being deceitful is like tricking a player or, or this and that. So if you play in a game that has like money or any of the any of the sorts, you're between trading, selling and buying, you're somewhat pranking your your opponent by trying to outdo them by outdo them in resources or take their resources and so on. So Farmville and most games are like that, and that's that's how you also define pranks in life. Meaning that there's a business model of pranks in video games and a business model in life. It's gonna be hard to understand until unless you like read it, and I tried my best to explain it, and it's still difficult for me to explain. So I'm sorry if you didn't get what I was trying to say. Moving on, transit. So transit is the emperor of reality. Well, I'm not gonna read the quote. I'll let you guys read the quote. But the case of transit that he's trying to explain in the book is very abstract and theoretical. So the, the, the way he quotes it is like, okay, there's a railroad, there's a train station, you know, trains were invented, you get from point A to point B. So how he relates it to reality is like, in reality, everything you do is getting from point A to point B. So, and then, and then like, and then how he relates it to trains is like, when you, you're on a train, the train is like this machine that you look through similar to our monitor or or our uh, TV console whatever you want to want to quote it as but it's look it's when you look outside the train you're looking into another world because your train is going from one point to another you're not seeing the space in between and similar to uh, to video games uh, when you play a game you don't really see like the coding and everything in the background you just go from one place to another point A to point B so he talks a lot about GTA, about flying, all this stuff, and about going in different vehicles and like having all these disabilities to try different type of transit. But he's mainly talking about the space in between. So games allow you to see that space in between because every day we we tend to forget the space in between as we go from one place to another because that's our main focus. Continuing on, relaxation video games people say are lean forward mediums while others are lean back mediums. It is one of the features that distinguishes games from television, even if the former are often played on the latter. Meaning that when you play video games, you complete tasks, meaning that you do something for it that differentiates itself from TV, which is a lean back medium. Lean back medium meaning that it's relaxing. 
So when you're sitting back and you're relaxing uh, and watching TV, they say that that's what lean back media is and that, that games are not the definition of it. But when we look at these two games that I posted here on this PowerPoint, Call of Duty Advanced Warfare and Animal Crossing. Call of Duty Advanced Warfare definitely has an objective to it that you have to move forward, you have to progress, and when you progress, you get some sort of weapons and, 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 and some and somewhat. But Animal Crossing would be set more in the lean back medium where you just sit back and you wait and you don't have to do anything, honest truth. You just sit back and enjoy the game. So, in the sense of how he explained it, lean, lean forward, lead back, it's the same thing. Games have both. And depending on the type of game you play, is what how you can define if the game is a lean forward or lean back game. The drill. So, near close to the end of the chapter, uh, I mean, you know, one of the ending chapters, when considering the unique powers of video games, we may cite the ability to engage us in thorny challenges. Meaning that the drill, I was trying to understand, what does he mean by drill? Is it a system of things that we do every day? No. The drill is, when you see a game, what do you, what's your first thing that comes to mind? What is the challenges in the game? What are the difficulties? What are the dangers? You know, uh, where, where do I stand in the game? And so on. These, these things is what he refers to the drill. Is the drill is what you expect from a game. So, as he continues, uh, we'll continue the next. Uh, he talks about the end of gamers. Soon gamers will be an anomaly. If we're, we're very fortunate, they'll disappear altogether. But instead, we'll just find people, ordinary people of all sorts, and sometimes those people will play video games, and it won't be a big deal at all. Meaning, you know, similar to art, as time comes by, it's a, it's a trend, and eventually it will just disappear in the overwhelming, uh, disappear in the culture as a norm. So the sense of, uh, you know, from the uh, relaxation and all this, like how they, how people are depicting gamers, is eventually going to go away as time progresses and as more people are born in the age of video games, and and instead of seeing it, oh yeah, Yo, you're a gamer, or more of seeing it, oh wow, you played that video game. So that's what he means by end of gamers. Doesn't mean that gamers will just stop playing games. It means that gamers will cu will will assim assimilate in the in in society that it's just an, a social norm. And that's the end. Oof. Ugh, that was a lot. Uh, stop.